Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Chenion, and today I'm going to talk about a new option of S-Trace, uh, second BPF. So if you've been staying in this room for the last two talks, you've already heard about second BPF, but in this talk, I'm going to go into the details of how it works uh, behind the hood, under the hood. So as an overview of this talk, I'm going to first go into uh, explaining how S-Trace uses P-Trace to stop at syscalls. Um, then I'm going to explain how it uses uh, second BPF to stop only at syscalls of interest. So that's what the ocean is doing. And finally, we're going to see, uh, while we're talking about this, we're going to see the two CBPF algorithms that are being used to decide on which syscalls to stop. So s -trace default behavior. So at the top of the slide, you've got the thread that you're trying to, to trace, so tracy and s -trace. Uh, so when you start uh, tracing this uh, tracy process, um, first it's going to do some initialization with regard to uh, ptrace. And then when it's ready to start the tracy, it's going to start it with a ptrace command known as uh, ptrace syscall. So what this command is going to do is uh, stop the tracy at each syscall entry and exit. Uh, so for instance, if my tracy starts, it's going to do some processing in user space, for instance. And then when it gets into the kernel mode uh, with a syscall, it's going to, uh, ptrace is going to stop the tracy, uh, stop it with a syscall entry stop event, and then uh, give control to strace in user space. So then once uh, strace is done uh, processing this syscall entry, it's going to restart it again with ptrace syscall to stop at the syscall exit uh, this time. So it's going to keep doing this. So every time you stop, you have two context switches, uh, to and from uh, S-Trace and user space, and then, of course, uh, two stops per Cisco. So what's the issue here? Um, so the, the issue um, comes to, to light if you think about the uh, uh, trace qualifier. So it, the trace qualifier is a way to select which syscalls you'd like to see. So for instance, if you only want to see the second syscall, you're going to do uh, dash E trace equals syscomp. Uh, you can do the same with dash e seccom. Uh, and then you've got some other um, aliases, for instance, for all of the network-related syscalls, such as percentage network. However, uh, when you're doing this, it's still going to stop twice per syscall at all syscalls. So even if you don't want to see the read syscall, for instance, it's still going to stop at all of the read syscalls. <coughs> so as I said, this involves two context switches. It's very, very expensive. Uh, so we have seen previ in previous talks uh, some examples with DD, so that's probably one of the worst cases. Uh, but if you're trying to do, for instance, uh, compile a Linux kernel, so on my old computer it took about 12 minutes. Uh, if I'm trying to do the same with S-Trace, even if I'm trying to see only a single syscall, so the connect one in this case, uh, it's going to take 24 minutes, uh, so double that. So we need a way to tell the kernel at which syscalls we want to stop. And we need to do this in the kernel because obviously uh, it's the kernel it's, that is going to decide when to stop. If we do this in user space, it's too late. We're already stopped. So we need a way to do this in the kernel. So from the name of the option, you've probably guessed that we're going to use second BPF. Uh, so second is a way to um, filter syscalls in the kernel. It's meant for sandboxing. Uh, it, one of the first users uh, in particular of second BPF is the, the Chrome sandbox. Uh, so second BPF allows you to choose which syscalls you want to filter, so which syscalls you want to allow and what you want to do otherwise. Um, <coughs> as a side note, uh, second BPF is, a second, is the second user of BPF in the Linux kernel uh, after the socket filters, but before all of the other uh, eBPF stuff you've probably heard about. Uh, and it's CBPF in second BPF. It's not eBPF, so it's very much limited compared to what eBPF can do. Okay, so one example, if you want to allow process to do open and open at syscalls, um, but you want to kill it if it tries anything else, you're going to load this small BPF program, CBPF program in the kernel. Uh, so the third line is actually loading the syscall number. So it's the uh, NR field of second data. Then you're going to compare that with 257, which is open at, and then two, which is open. And that's only true on the uh, x86-64 architecture. Once you've done that, you're going to uh, jump either to bad or good. So bad would be uh, we're killing this thread, and good is simply we're uh, allowing this syscall, so we're just going to do the usual processing of the syscall in the kernel. 
Now, if you want to do pretty much the same thing, but this time you want to allow specific uh, accesses, you want to allow processes to open specific files, you're going to need help from user space because you need to go and look into the file path, for instance, uh, to take your decision. So in order to do this, you're going to change slightly the program. This time, in instead of returning red allow to continue processing the syscode, you're going to return red trace. And in this case, uh, seccomp is going to call into ptrace to stop your your tracy, your process, and it's going to give control to a ptracer in user space. So in our case, it might be strace. Okay, so strace uh, second BPF. So the, the behavior changes a little. Uh, so if we take the same scheme as before, uh, we're going to start in user space. Uh, strace is doing some initialization, and when it's done, it's going to start the tracy this time with the ptrace count uh, command. So. What this is telling is simply that uh, the tracy is supposed to behave as usual. It's not going to stop at any syscalls. It should just process uh, the syscalls and do whatever it does. So the tracy can do uh, syscalls, uh, can do some processing in the space. It can do syscalls. If we're not interested in the syscalls, we're still going to have the BPF program uh, that is going to run to determine if the syscall is of interest or not. If it's not of interest, it's simply going to allow the syscall and let it go. So we can do some processing like this. But once we get in the kernel with a syscall of interest, uh, the CBPF program is going to return uh, red, red trace. And in this case, we're going to have a second stop. So it's a different event from the previous stops we had. Um, and this is going to give control to S trace in user space with a context switch. Once uh, strace is done doing the processing for this syscall entry, it's going to restart the process with ptrace syscall. And the reason we can't use uh, ptrace continue for this, uh, for, to go to the exit of the syscall is simply because uh, second BPF does not run on syscall exits. So second BPF is meant for sandboxing, so you usually want to limit which uh, syscall entries you can do and not which syscall exits you can do. Okay, so it's going to keep doing this. Uh, once we exit the syscall, it's going to restart it with ptrace continue again because we know that we can stop with uh, the second BPF program at the next entry uh, to a syscall. There's one caveat to this, however. Uh, in uh, Linux, uh, before Linux uh, 4.8, uh, the second stop happened before the syscall entry. So what that means is that uh, we have to, we can do the same as before, so we can restart it with ptrace continue uh, at first. But then once, once we reach the second stop, we have to restart it with ptrace syscall to get to the entry and then again to get to the exit. And because of that, uh, in Linux uh, before 4.8, <coughs> we have two stops per syscall instead of one uh, when the second BPF option is enabled. Okay, so what about the CBPF uh, programs? Because I talked about how we uh, changed the way we stopped the process, but I haven't talked about the uh, CBPF program itself. So one first naive way to do it would be to do a linear search through all of the different uh, syscall numbers we're interested in. So for instance here, if I'm interested in uh, read, write, open, close, stat, and fstat, I'm going to go over all of the different numbers, and if, it, if the syscall uh, numbers, so the NR field of second data matches one of these, I'm going to jump to trace and return the uh, return code that uh, we need. So is this uh, optimal? Uh, obviously not. Uh, so this is O of N. Uh, if we want to improve it a little, there's one obvious optimization here. Uh, we can simply uh, optimize a contiguous set of syscalls. So for instance, I was going uh, from 0 to 5. I could simply check that uh, my syscall number is between 0 and 5. And if that's the case, I can just jump uh, to the trace uh, command. So what we're trying to optimize here is the, the size of the program because uh, in CBPF, uh, instead of um, eBPF, we're limited in how many uh, instructions we can have in our uh, BPF program. So we're limited to, I think, uh, 4K instructions. Uh, and therefore, we have to limit, uh, we have to ensure that our programs are as small as possible uh, because they're first going to be faster to execute in most cases, but mostly because we want to ensure that we can load the BPF program in the kernel. Okay, is that the best we can do? Um, in some cases, it's still not the best we can do. So what is the worst case of this? If we have um, some user that is trying to trace all uh, odd numbered syscalls, uh, we are not going to be able to use this optimization and we're going to have a lot of different uh, instructions to compare the, the syscall numbers. 
So what we can do instead is, uh, since in CBPF we have 32-bit uh, uh, bitwise operations, we can encode the syscall numbers that we're interested in into 32-bit bit arrays. And then we're going to go over all of these bit arrays and compare our syscall number with the appropriate offset in the bit array. So basically here, if I want to trace uh, select an IOCTL, I'm going to set the, the bit corresponding in the given bit array. So this is the first bit array in this case, because they're select an IOCTL of small number. Um, and then we're going to go over all of the different bit arrays uh, with our BPF program and we're going to select the appropriate offset once we reach the appropriate bit array, and we're going to check if it's to one or zero. So the reason we can't jump directly to the bit array that we're interested in is that in CBPF you do not have indirect jumps. So you're, you have to implement your switch case as an if-else and going over all of the different cases. Okay, so we compared the two different algorithms um, with different uh, set of syscalls filtered. Uh, so the first one is just none and ptrace and um, not ptrace, basically everything except ptrace. And then we've got some cases with uh, aliases that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the last one is just a combination of different aliases uh, to get a larger number of syscalls. So what we can see is that in most cases, uh, the linear algorithm with the optimization I mentioned uh, is much uh, generates much smaller programs than the uh, binary match. In some cases, however, uh, when we have a large number of syscall in particular, uh, the binary match is going to give a better result. So the reason for this is that in the case of the binary match, we have to do some pre-processing on the syscall number to get the appropriate offset, and then the bit array, we have to encode all the bit arrays. So this is more or less consensus size uh, programs, but uh, there is still a lot of processing to do even if you have only a single Cisco filter. So what we did in S-Trace uh, is we uh, generate both programs uh, when we start S-Trace, and then we're going to decide based on uh, which is the smallest. We're going to load the smallest in the kernel uh, in order to get the best of both approaches. Okay, some limitations uh, of this uh, option. So the first limitation, uh, which Dimitri already mentioned, is that uh, second BPF implies uh, dash F. So dash F, uh, trace dash F, uh, means that you're going to trace all of the children of your um, trace process uh, when they fork, when they clone. And so the, the reason for that is that uh, in the kernel, uh, the children inherit a second filter chain of program uh, from their parents. And the way they do this in the kernel is that they give simply a reference to the beginning of the chain uh, to the children. So each children uh, in the kernel will have a reference to uh, the second filter chain of the parent. And however, if we want, so if we have a chain, for instance, of uh, second filters one, two, three, four, uh, but on, we only want to inherit one, two, and four because the third one is the S trace pro program, the S trace VPF program. Uh, so we don't want to inherit it for children. Uh, if we want to do this, we'll have to reconstruct the chain to have one, two, and four. So we want to skip the third one. And we can't do this with uh, references in the kernel, so currently there's no good way to do this, except if we make copies, but then there's a lot of hardware to copying the whole chain of uh, second filters. Okay, the second limitation of this option is uh, dash P. So if you want to trace an existing process, you cannot use today the second uh, BPF option. Uh, the reason for that is very simple. There's currently no way to attach uh, a second BPF program to an already running uh, process uh, in the Linux kernel. Um, there is, however, uh, a way to, when you attach a program to a thread of a, a group of threads, uh, there is a way to synchronize the second BPF programs across all threads in the group. So maybe there is some hackish way to do this, but yeah, not sure. Okay, to conclude, uh, to sum up first, uh, the, we've seen that uh, S-Trace uh, stops at all syscalls by default, and that's very, very expensive because of context switches. Uh, in addition, we've seen that the second BPF option when you're using filters on your syscalls allows you to stop only at syscalls of interest. And we've seen the two different second BPF algorithms that we're using in S-Trace uh, to do this, to implement this match over syscalls. There are, however, some uh, things that could be improved uh, in the current implementation that are pretty straightforward. So the first one is uh, on some architectures, you've got uh, system calls like so socket call and IPC, which allow you to do 
basically all the syscalls. So you would have the first argument of socket call, for instance, would tell you which syscall to actually do. So for instance, do a, a connect or maybe something like this. Uh, currently, this is not supported in the CBPF program because you would have to match on the first argument of the syscalls. You would have to match on the, the number that is the first argument of socket call, for instance. Uh, the second thing that uh, could be done is the, uh, the, the strace-c uh, option, which currently allows you to print a summary of statistics on your, your syscalls. Uh, this is a perfect use case for eBPF instead of CBPF. Uh, because eBPF allows you to aggregate data in the kernel, uh, and therefore it could allow you to aggregate statistics for this option to only print, to only send them to the S-trace process at the end. So instead of sending everything to the S-trace process and stopping all the time, you could only send um, a summary of these statistics. Okay, so I've been a bit fast, so we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I hope you have some, and thanks for listening. Sorry. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, so I don't have the numbers. So the question is, did I run the second BPF benchmark with the, did I run, sorry, the Linux compilation benchmark with the second BPF option? Uh, I did. I don't have the numbers here, but might have them online. Okay. So here, if you can see the, 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 the one before last, so the, the second one, uh, is the number with uh, second BPF. So it has a few seconds, but yeah, nothing much. Um, yeah. You talked about eBPF and CBPF. Is that a limitation of what second allows current supports in the kernel? Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, I've talked about CBPF and eBPF and whether that is a limitation of what second allows in the kernel. Uh, so second only allows CBPF programs in the kernel. There's been some discussion to allow eBPF yeah. on the mailing list, but that's pretty much, I don't think it's going to get there. So the, the, the answer was very clearly that this is not something they'd want. Uh, the main reason for this, I think, is the unprivileged uh, eBPF programs that this would require, and they don't want e any more uh, unprivileged eBPF programs. So. Probably well, should we see this change in the kernel to allow uh, detaching BPF programs from from forked processes. So the question, so the question is, uh, should we um, try to uh, upstream some work in the kernel to allow um, to allow us to detach uh, second BPF programs from from processes? Um, I guess we can always try. Uh, the I don't know if there's any. I'm afraid it will take about nine months, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, detaching HDF uh, from process uh, will be tra uh, as security issue. Yeah, that's probably the main concern they're going to raise is the security aspect. So what if... But I don't see how that could be misused, because if you're actually trying to detach a program from your process, I mean, you're asking for it, so maybe you need privileges for the, for, in order to do that, but... I personally don't think this is a security issue because when you're attaching a program, you can explicitly say that this program should not be uh, inherited. And this way, it wouldn't be any security issue. Yeah, it will require revoking the kernel. <coughs> That's why I'm asking this question. Yeah, but then we go. We should try this. This would allow to uh, support second BPF with full forks and without, not just with full forks, but also without full forks. There might be some issues with the performance there, because because of the way it's implemented in the kernel, it's yeah. reference count. With so, yeah. if we want to remove one from the chain, it's going to be yeah, exactly. kind of difficult. Yeah. Any other questions? So the next talk is about eBPF this time. So <laughs> if you want to listen to some eBPF, you have to list to stay here. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.